Um, and so God provides, and, and we have this really cool family. And so um, to let you know, we are going to start a new series today, and uh, Worth is out of town for this month. So I'm in charge, all right? And uh, what that means is things are going to be a little... No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, the, uh, in actuality, I got to pick the series, and a while ago... I, um, I, I had done a little personal study in a book that rarely ever gets preached on, okay? And um, so this summer, I'm going to get a little bit of a chance to go over this book that has really impacted me as a person, and um, so I invite you to be part of it. So we're going to kind of do old school, all right? If you have your Bible in front of you, um, I'm going to invite you to open it. If you don't want to, that's totally fine. It'll be up on the screen as usual. Um, but we're going to go to page 940, okay? Um, and I'm going to be sharing a little bit about a book called Philemon. Now, uh, I have, when I told my kids I was going to be doing a Philemon, uh, they were like, I guarantee you it's got to be a short book. And I'm like, yes, it's only one chapter. It's only 25 verses, all right? And I wrote eight weeks of of sermons on this, Worth gave me four, all right? So I'm going to, I really am excited about this book. And there's a reason that you don't hear about it often. It's delicate, it's complicated, and a lot of times ministers don't go over these books just because the subject matter is complicated to talk about. I want us to look at it because I think the reason that a lot of people don't and or, or they avoid this is really an opportunity to talk about some things that are hard to talk about. I want us to not be afraid of scripture because this is God's word. And I, just like you, I, I, I'll read through sometimes and it's like you come to these really complicated texts. I, they don't fit socially, they don't fit politically, culturally, they're hard to understand. And a lot of times I think we as people just like, okay, we're going to kind of avoid that area. Okay, we'll move on to something that's a little more comfortable. Let's love everybody, right? Okay, that becomes sort of our perspective, but I want to dig into this little book. I want us to see that there's a huge benefit that is to each and every one of us. I mean, today, I want us to look at these, a couple of these verses, and I want you to see that God literally communicates to us the same way as these 25 verses, he's communicating something important and special for us today. But the reason that it's complicated, the reason that a lot of people skip over this little book called Philemon is because in it, it deals with, and it looks like the Bible is almost pro-slavery. Okay, when you read through these verses, you look and you think, wait, wait, what is, what is it, what's being said here? I want us to connect, I want us to look at it deeply today and I want you to see that I believe very strongly that what happens here is the best rationale against slavery, but you see something even more coming out of it. The way that Paul works in this small letter written to a friend of his, I think teaches us the way we are supposed to respond to each other, to God, to ourselves, and how we treat each other. Now, I love this book. It's, again, like I said, it's only 25 verses, but there's a couple of very unique things about the book of Philemon. Number one, Paul tells us that he actually writes this book. Like, he hand writes it out. That is different than the other books that Paul has shared with us. He would dictate a book to someone else. They would write it. But Paul writes this one. He writes it in his own hand. And that tells us something right away. That it's important that this is something he was making very, very personal. Another thing that's very unique about this book is that as it plays out, you start to really connect with Paul's personality. It is very, very much, very, very emotionally, it's very strong relationally, it very much has a care over two people. He's very focused on them. I want you to see a little bit of Paul's personality 
This is a little bit later on in Paul's life. This is right kind of at the end of his ministry. And Paul is in prison. He's in prison in Rome. And that's really where this whole story starts to take place. Paul is there and he writes this letter to a guy named Philemon. Now Philemon was somebody that Paul had had a huge impact in Philemon's life. Philemon lived pretty far away from Rome and Paul had met him probably at the city called Colossae. So it's the same place, like if you think of Colossians, that's what that, that letter was written to that group of people. This is kind of that general area of where Philemon would have lived. When we start to dig into these 25 verses, we learn a couple of things about Philemon. Number one, Philemon is a Roman citizen, so he's got some privileges. At that time in Rome, if you were a Roman citizen, you, you were like the cut above. You had the opportunities, uh, you had all of the rights. A lot of other people didn't have rights in that culture, but you did. We learn a second thing about Philemon. Philemon, the whole church would meet at his house, all right? Now, in a time, in a culture where houses weren't very big, we see that Philemon had a pretty big house. The whole church could meet at his house. The third thing that we realize is not only does Philemon have a pretty big house, not only is he wealthy, but he also has slaves. Now, we see that and we think, well, What's a letter that's from Paul going to look like to somebody who has slaves? How, how, I mean, certainly he's going to attack this. Certainly we all know it's abhorrent, it's wrong, it's evil, it's sinful. I mean, you look back at the Old Testament, Exodus 21 has a whole big uh, uh, statement against slavery. It says, if you take somebody from their country basically stealing a human being, it's a capital offense. It is capital punishment is going to be relegated on you. All right? So we know that it's wrong. So we expect Paul's letter to somehow attack Philemon for this. But the letter is different. Paul goes about it in a different way. Now today what I want us to see is that when we come across complicated texts in Scripture, we can remember a few things. Number one... The Bible is not mine, and it is not yours. This is God's word. He preserved it, all right? He has given it to us to provide direction, correction, support, um, I would say encouragement, lots of different things God's word does. But I think it's incumbent upon us as people to dig into this, to find out what it says, to, to be honest to the text itself, not to let somebody else tell you what it, what it is, not to um, be uh, somebody who twists it and uses it for themselves. I mean, people use the book of Philemon in the Old South to basically say slavery was okay, all right? We know it's not. We know that's not the case, but that's part of the human heart, is to twist things that God gives us and create it into something that we want. All right, something that we desire, we, we want it to say. I want us to be honest with this text. And we see a story start to come out of here about a couple of people. First, there's Paul, and Paul's writing this letter to Philemon. And the second person that we're going to look at is not just Philemon, but Onesimus. And Onesimus is this guy, and, and he had been working. He was literally a slave, a servant in the house of Philemon. Now, in Roman culture, at Roman, at the ancient Rome, if you look at these, this time period, one-third to almost a half of the entire population was in some type of slavery, some type of indentured servitude, okay? And it happened multiple ways. One way that it happened was it was an economic type of, of agreement, all right? If you owed money, all right, let's say that, uh, we'll think of this, no credit scores, no Visa, American Express, nowhere to get us in trouble, okay? If you owed money, if you owed money, you could set up a relationship with somebody and say, basically, I'm going to be underneath of you, okay? I'm going to work for you for this time period if you'll pay off my debt, 
okay? And if you didn't have the, the funds and resources to be able to pay off your debt, this was an option for you, okay? And at the end of that tenure, uh, hopefully it was agreed upon well and, and, and you're, you're done when that time period was over. Second way was if the Roman legions and military had taken over an area, they would incorporate and assimilate that whole group of people in and a lot of times they ended up as slaves. And then there was forced labor as well, forced labor without any type of compensation. This was happening in the Roman world. We see a world that is very broken. We see a world where people are being mistreated. And we would expect Paul right away to attack the institution of this wrongdoing that does not value people, that does not treat people fairly and equitably. We look at this and Paul goes about it different. Now, I would say this. He could have made this like two sentences, all right? We'll see in just a minute. Philemon, you've got to stop this, okay? But he goes about it in a way that I think is not behavior focused, but is transformational heart work that he does to address this, okay? Now, we look at this, and I need to let you know a little bit about more about the story. Onesimus is this character, and Onesimus is really in trouble with the Roman law in two different ways. The first is, there has been a major problem between him and Philemon, okay? The major problem that's happened between them, it's not explicitly stated in the passage, but we do know this. It looks like he probably stole something from Philemon, a value, okay? Because a debt has been created. The second thing is, Philemon not only steals, he runs away. Now, in Roman law, a slave who has run away is literally, if you combine the stealing and running away, those two things, it's capital punishment right there. I mean, he could literally be put in prison for good or even, even possibly killed. Roman law was very harsh, okay? And Onesimus is on the run, all right? And he's running away, and he ends up in Rome. And there in Rome, this guy Onesimus, who probably looked at Rome as like, this is the opportunity for me to get away, all right? There's a, there's a large population of freed slaves at this time in Rome. There's also a, a lot of runaway slaves that are, I mean, he, he can just blend in, all right? He can just basically become somewhat anonymous. But it's during that time in Rome that Onesimus meets Paul. And I don't know if Onesimus ended up in prison, if that's how he met Paul because Paul's in prison, or if he sought Paul out. But whatever the case, we know from this book of Philemon, okay, we're getting a lot out of these 25 verses already, okay? We know that Paul shares the gospel and Onesimus becomes a believer, and I imagine what the conversation might have been like one day when Onesimus tells Paul his story. So yeah, I was basically in this city called Colossae, and I was there, and um, yeah, I, I stole something, um, and then I ran away. I was a slave, you know, and, and everything. And, and Paul says, you know, I've been there before. Like, like, tell me a little bit more about this. And starts to tell him, and it's like, wait, wait, wait. Are you talking about a guy named Philemon? Does he have a church in his house? I'm making this up, by the way. I don't know this really happened. But, but at some point, Paul realizes, oh my goodness, I know Philemon, and I know you. And he realizes there's a huge relational rift between these two. Now, if you've ever had something stolen or taken from you, you already know how Philemon feels. Okay, let's, let's just deal with the stealing part right now. Okay, if your house has ever been robbed, it feels different the next time you walk in. And for a while, you feel violated, you feel wronged. And, and let's, let's talk human nature for a second. We can all be very free here, okay? When we're wronged, we really like to see justice done, right? I mean, if I'm wronged, this is confessional right here, okay? And I know this is the way it is for you too. When I'm wronged, I really want the disruption that whatever the wrong caused me to be like multiplied like to the seventh power for them, okay? Right? All right, if I get cut off in traffic, all right, I'm, I'm a lot better than I used to be, but I kind of do still want to get in front of them and just slow down really fast, you know? Um, we want justice of some kind. 
And here, Paul knows, Paul knows that Roman law is really in favor of Philemon. All right? They're not going to look at Onesimus and say anything. They're going to look at Philemon and they're going to say, you have every right to go after him. And you know what? According to the law, he sure did. All right? He had every right to go after him. But Paul does something unique. Paul writes this handwritten letter to Philemon. He handwrites it. And he's going to talk to him, and he's not going to aim at the behaviors that Philemon has done. I want you to see what he does that is different. Let's go to the God's Word. Um, this is the book of Philemon. This is the first verse. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet, for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also, for Jesus Christ. I want you to see what's being done here. He says these things at the beginning that are from his heart. Philemon has been a friend. Philemon has been a breath of fresh air in a guy's life who he has had a seriously rough go and a lot of pitfalls through his life. Philemon has been good to him. Philemon probably provided Paul with a place of rest. There's probably a lot of things that happen. Paul here talks about the affection, but he's going to deal with the problem now. And he says, I could tell you what to do. I could tell you what is required of you. I could tell you your behavior is wrong. Stop this, but I'm not going to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to appeal on the basis of love. I am going to appeal to you. Look what it says. It says... Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. I want to tell you this for just a moment. Think about parenting for a second. Okay, he uses child and brother talk here coming up. If I go to my children and I say, do not do this, I can. Okay, now I'm not saying they'll, they'll follow through on it, but I can do that. But I have find, found it far more effective if I appeal to them. All right? If I, in a moment, I'm not concerned about behavior change, but I am concerned about their hearts. I mean, just think about it in relation to the way that we want our kids to be talking. Okay? I, I don't want to go to my kids, don't ever say that again. Okay? That's, that's bad. Don't do that. Okay? I'd much rather say something along the lines of, listen, we don't talk to people like that because we value them. We love them. All right? We're not over anybody. And you're also not less than anybody. But we don't talk to people like that because they're made in God's image. All right? The, the whole idea of racism and bullying and all those kinds of things gets resolved when you realize, wait, this is, I have no right to do that. That is literally saying something against God himself because that person is God's image just as much as I am. Isn't that a lot more effective than saying, don't you ever say that again? Okay? That's my, my parent voice right there, okay? Those kinds of moments, 
I see Paul is doing something that is not aimed at just getting him to change maybe the way he's doing his business. He's now appealing to his heart. He's appealing to him as a person. He is appealing to this man Philemon. And he's going to draw him back to something else. Yeah, you have every right in Roman law to do what you want with this situation. But I want to ask you to do something drastically different. Philemon, Philemon, I want you to consider for just a moment that you have been a forgiven person. He's going to go and he's going to look and he's going to say, you've got to understand, you've got to understand what's been done to you. Now I want you to share that same forgiveness with your brother Onesimus. You read down a few verses later and it starts to really come out like an absolute beautiful uh, moment, a a tidal wave of the way we're supposed to deal with each other. He says this, I'm going to send Onesimus back to you, okay? And this is where a lot of people have had a problem. They've said, why would Paul send back Onesimus, all right? Never should he have sent him back. But Paul says why and how he sends him back. He says, I don't send him back as a slave. I send him back as your brother. Essentially, he's saying this. Philemon, remember what you have been forgiven of. Now, I want you to forgive him. Okay? I want you to forgive him for the debt that he created between the two of you. And he develops it even more to show Philemon, Philemon, you're no different. You are no different. You have no ground to stand upon and be his judge. Because you are a conduit of the same grace that you have been provided in his life. Okay? He doesn't come back to you as a slave. Okay? The person that wronged you, you don't begrudgingly take him back. You bring him back like a family member. Okay? And a family member, you're going to treat very differently than you do over someone that you think owes you something. Okay? A family member sits at the real table. All right? The family member, the one that gets invited over for the good stuff. All right? And in in our world, and, and we all have family problems, we all have struggles that we deal with as people with our families. This is what family should be like, is what he's saying. You take him back because he is your brother. And that's how you're going to treat him. Let me tell you something. The best answer to the ills and the violence and the evil and the despicable, pathological uh, problems that we see of slavery in our history and in other other, uh, countries even today, that whole thing, imagine what's being said here. The way that Paul goes after this idea of slavery is saying, you treat him like your brother. Let me tell you something, you don't own your brother. You don't mistreat your brother. You shouldn't, right? I mean, the whole point is that you see this is your family member. In fact, every single human being is made in the image of God. Does that change the way that we think and deal with each other? I mean, does that make you think for just a moment that that other person has value and importance, okay? Forget everything else. This is God's will for your life. People want to know what it is. You know what? Treat people as your brother. Treat them as your sister. All right? It honestly will change the way we interact in the world today. I look at this guy, Philemon. All right? He gets this. And he gets this letter. But it's not just to Philemon. Look up at those names that are a little bit hard to say. All right? I say them different every time I read it. Okay? He sent this letter to the whole church. You know why? Because it wasn't just for Philemon. It was for everybody at that church. And I think it put a little pressure on Philemon, to be honest with you. Okay? It's like, you better step up. Paul said this, you know. But also it goes to all of us. This absolutely goes to all of us. See, the beauty that comes out of this that I see is Paul is trying to communicate Like God is trying to communicate through Paul's writing and this passage of scripture to each and every one of us today. It's, it's, to me, it is a big, big, like, um, poignant moment for us to say, how do we treat other people? 
Do we bring the sweetness of God's grace and love into people's lives? Or do we bring the confines and the shackles of culture and the way that our, our, our own desires into over other people? Okay? It makes us have to consider. Because there's a beautiful thing that comes out of this is that Paul and Onesimus and Philemon, they're all equals. All right? And maybe Rome said, oh, well, you're, you're better, Philemon. You're, you're, you've got all the rights here. Okay? But not in God's world. Not at all. It, it doesn't matter your economics. It doesn't matter your, uh, how many like, consonants you have on the end of your name of degrees. It doesn't matter in that sense. We are equal. And I mean, that's not really a nice thing to say because all of us, all three of those men were in desperate need of God's forgiveness. Each and every one of them. They were on that exact same plane. They all needed God's forgiveness. And when Paul appeals to Philemon's heart, he's saying, you needed this forgiveness. You now need to go and forgive. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been forgiven of something pretty major? Have you ever been forgiven? I mean, the answer should probably be yes for everybody here, right? And I remember, and I share this story a, uh, a couple of times through the years. I remember being forgiven one time and I was absolutely in huge trouble, okay? Um, I, I, when I was younger, I, my parents were leaving for a weekend. And um, I had a yellow Nissan pickup truck, okay? My friends, it was so ugly, my friends called it the corn cop, all right? It was, it, it was just, it was a joke around our town, okay, of that is the ugliest truck ever. My dad had a nice car. My mom and dad leave for a weekend, and my dad tells me, hey, I'm doing some work on the car, all right? Um, don't use it this weekend. The door, when they left, didn't stop echoing till I had already found his keys. And I got in his car, I started it up, and I started down the street, and it stopped. It's because all the oil had been drained out of it. My dad was doing some pretty serious work on his car. And I was now in huge trouble. And I remember in that moment of great stress and angst and all of these things that like maybe I just need to pack a backpack and head to the Greyhound station because it is over. All right? And I am done. I let my parents know over a really very memorable phone call. And um, my dad, when they got home, uh, you know, I, I knew what I deserved. I knew, I mean, there's no way around this one. There is absolutely no way around it. And I remember my dad saying, do not worry. We're going to figure this out. But I will never forget him saying, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. The weight of my debt was off my back, in a sense. Okay, now I... I Obviously, we worked and I, I, I was able to replace it and we, we figured it out over time. But the fact of being forgiven, when I feel like I don't want to forgive, I go back to that, that I was forgiven. And much bigger than that is the understanding that we've been forgiven by Christ for what we've done. Like literally, that's game-changing, life-changing, and behavior-changing all at the same time. All right, think in Philemon's case. To know that he's forgiven, it changes the way he's going to deal with Onesimus. And it should. And Onesimus back to Philemon and Paul the... It literally changes that whole church, that whole group of people, is changed by one reminder we are forgiven people. Therefore, we are conduits of that same forgiveness and grace that we have been given with others. Okay? You think about that just for a moment. The beauty of forgiveness is it doesn't reside just with you. It's what puts relationships back together. It's what allows us to forgive people that have wronged us. And to let that debt, to let that debt be forgiven. And let it go. There's something else very interesting here with Paul. There's something that he doesn't do in, the, in all 25 verses of Philemon that he does in every other book he ever wrote. It's this. He never 
talks about Jesus on the cross. He never talks about the resurrection. Never. He never talks about any of those things. He didn't have to. Because here in these verses, he actually does it. If you look down a few verses later, he says this to Philemon. He says, if Onesimus has any debt, what I want you to do is I want you to put it on my account. I will pay for it. I will take care of any debt that Onesimus owes you, Philemon. Okay? Let me tell you something. That is the gospel. Do you realize that the debt that we have in our brokenness and in our shame and all the brokenness of our world, okay, the deep roots that are in all of us, you can't do anything about it. You can't forgive yourself of those things. Essentially, Jesus goes to the cross and he absorbs that. He, he takes it upon himself. When Paul says, I... Whatever his debt is, I'll take, I'm going to cancel, I'm going to, I'm going to pay for it. That's what Jesus does on the cross. He pays the debt that we can't pay right there. Okay? You've been forgiven as a believer. Like, the debt was paid on the cross, and he did it. And Philemon must have read this handwritten letter from Paul and thought for just a moment, oh yeah, that's exactly what happened. That is exactly what happened. He is saying, I will pay the debt that this, this guy owes. The one that he can't pay, I'll take care of that. And Philemon in that moment had a big decision to make. I believe that out of this came something amazing. That these two, like, I mean imagine, just think for a second. The conflict had an opportunity to be resolved. All right? And what once was a master and slave relationship is now, in a beautiful way, brothers. They're literally family members in God's world, the way that God does it. And I think it's the yearning for each one of our hearts to be in those kind of relationships. Like that's the image of God in you is that you desire to be connected. You desire when things go wrong. That's why we're hurt so badly. Okay. I see this book of Philemon as a great opportunity for us to understand the way relationships work. And God's design for them. But I want to encourage each and every one of you today with this. Remember what happened at the cross. Remember that a debt you couldn't pay was forgiven through Christ. And if you don't know Christ, today is the good day to do it. All right? He says, the door is open. I'm knocking. I, I want you. I think for those of us as believers, we look at this too and we say, this is the model of the way that we treat other people. I mean... A marriage is transformed when two people really see that the other person in the relationship is in God's image. They're not yours, okay? They're God's creation. They're God's. I mean, that should elevate the way we treat each other. That, that, that should be a commitment to working through problems, of, of not stepping outside of our marriage. It, it's, a, it's an absolute call to I love and cherish you as a person. And you're God's. And I get to be in a relationship with you. And you can let that start to ripple out to our children, to the people we work with, to that neighbor who plays their music really loud at night. Okay? It changes the way you even can be at the checkout in, a, uh, in, this, in Milam's or Publix or, or wherever God has put you, you realize you're kind of on holy reverent ground because all the people that are around you are opportunities to work with, to love, to appreciate, to forgive, all right, to challenge, to be honest with are your brothers and your sisters. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercy and grace in each one of our lives. Father, as we sing together, as um, we are together as a, a family of brothers and sisters together, Father, give us hearts like your heart. Father, help us in 
the relationships that you've given to us. Like, Lord, help us to parent our children as you have parented us. Um, Lord, help us to look at that person that you've put close to us in this life and, and realize the brevity and the, the gift and the opportunity of relationship. Lord, help us to um, care for each other. Um, and Father, thank you for the story. Um, Lord, thank you for the beauty of, of allowing us to dig through it um, in these next few weeks. Lord, thank you for loving us, and we are yours. Thank you today that we can call ourselves sons and daughters, because that's how you've chosen to call us. And we ask this in your name. Amen.